On the podcast today, we are going to dissect chapter 22 of the Tao Te Ching, which makes up the 22nd episode of the 81 meditations on the Tao Te Ching. And as usual, Guyang will read Jia Fu Feng and Jane English's translation, and I will read Derek Lin's translation. Yield and overcome, bend and be straight, empty and be full, wear out and be new, have little and gain, have much and be confused. Therefore the wise embrace the one and set an example to all. Not putting on a display, they shine forth. Not justifying themselves, they are distinguished. Not boasting, they receive recognition. Not bragging, they never falter. They do not quarrel, so no one quarrels with them. Therefore the ancients say, yield and overcome. Is that an empty saying? Be truly whole, and all things will come to you. Yield and remain whole. Bend and remain straight. Be low and become filled. Be worn out and become renewed. Have little and receive. Have much and be confused. Therefore the sages hold to the one as an example for the world. Without flaunting themselves, and so are seen clearly. Without presuming themselves, and so are distinguished, without praising themselves, and so have merit, without boasting about themselves, and so are lasting. Because they do not contend, the world cannot contend with them. What the ancients called the one who yields and remains whole, were they speaking empty words? Sincerity becoming whole and returning to oneself. This chapter reinforces the power of humility as the foundation of spiritual practice and spirituality itself which a lot of people overlook and was one reason why i wrote the science and practice of humility back in the day right when you and i were around a lot of satsangs and a lot of people lacked actually the foundational quality of humility and that was the impetus behind me to to write that book and it's with texts such as the Tao Te Ching that Lao Tzu reinforces that without humility you, you can't even enter the spiritual path you can't it's like the the gateway the opening but also the end of your spiritual path too that's what the science of humility actually truly is yeah that's how humility is so important isn't it mm. as you mentioned when we were uh, how you got inspired to write the your the first book science and practice of humility the humility is uh, the very essence of uh, entire universe very essence of 10,000 material things. It's the source of everything. And again, as you mentioned, the, uh, the end of your spiritual journey is come to humility again as well. So humility being most important uh, part of, of spiritual practice, so that here in, the, in this chapter, Lao Tzu basically explained how important to be humble and fully embrace the humility and make it part of your entire being, mm. right? Mm. So the first, very first line, yield and overcome. And he says this yield and overcome, this saying is the ancient to himself as well. Mm. So it's not something Lao Tzu made up or anything like that. Mm. The yield and overcome... This uh, such lesson came from like his ancient ancestors as well. Yeah, so thousands of years before him, like maybe from Fu Shi, maybe from Huang Di, we don't know, but that's why Lao Tzu says in it, like, were they speaking empty words when they were when they were saying yield and overcome or yield and remain whole? Yes. But the nature of it, as you said, it it's almost part of the foundational essence of the universe, humility itself, and that's why when we become humble ourselves, it's almost a gateway for the Tao to move through you because that's where the actual real power of the universe mm. comes from. And in Taoism, they often use water as an analogy. So water is the softest element in nature and uh, it always seeks the lowest places, but it's the most powerful force in nature. You know, it puts out fire, it can... And we can get a, have a tsunami. I mean, it can consume everything. Yes. But it's the essence of life. We need it to nourish ourselves, our existence. And that's, in some sense, how 
humility is and how it functions through us is when we seek the low places, so to speak, when we seek not to fight others or not to contend with others, then there's a power in that, a quality in that. And I mentioned in the science and practice of humility, I mentioned Lao Tzu and I mentioned even Ramana Maharshi, where through his silence and his own humility, that's what attracted people to him. There was power in it, right? He didn't have to know a lot of book knowledge. He was not a Swami. He was not a scholar. But in his silence is what, and humility is what attracted people. It's, there's a gravitational pull with that energy and that power. And, and actually, from Bhagavan's perspective, or from his life, that's what nourished many other people spiritually, even you and I, even beyond his death, right? Yes. So, and that's what humility actually does. And that's why water is a good analogy, because water nourishes all life, but always seeks the lowest places, and yet is the most paradox- it's the most paradoxical, powerful force in nature. Yes. But unfortunately, in the modern days, being humble is being regarded as being a little bit weak or mm. something like mm. that. Because I think people who recognize the power of humility is someone who had come to some kind of journey in their life, yeah. I think. Yeah. But if people see humility, humility as being some sort of negative uh, quality, that is, that individual is maybe not ready to recognize the power of humility, I don't think. And that's the very sad thing. And unfortunately, some people uh, identify humility with the word uh, humiliation and things like that. That's completely different to different vocabulary here. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. But again, the humility is something that we need to see it as something like an empty glass, mm. like... Hum, be humble as an empty glass, just like wa- your water analogy. Yeah. Because the glass is empty, it can contain anything. Yes. It can contain water, it can contain tea, milk, whatever you pour in, it, it allows it to stay in, within the cup, right? Yeah. So just like the empty glass, empty cup, if we stay humble, if we, obviously internally, we stay empty just like that empty glass then we can have that power and strength to contain anything right Mm. and we can overcome whatever is going through you right in that moment well that's why when in Derek's translation he says be low and become filled so that we could translate as be empty and become filled Mm. so as you said with the, the cup analogy because you have an empty cup you can imbibe experience purely because you don't have any preconceived notions. You don't have a lot of opinions. And so when the experience comes into you, you are are open and receptive to the experience. Your consciousness consciousness is not contracted. It it is expansive. And so you're experiencing life very purely. Mm -hmm. And that's actually how the Tao can make use of you because when we have a lot of preconceived notions or a lot of opinions and a lot of conditioning, it's hard for the Tao to make use of us because we already have an idea of how the world is. And that's Lao Tzu's point, right? When he says don't have any, the sages don't have any presumptions. They don't presume. They don't, they don't act as if they know something. They are open to change. They are open to maybe that they are wrong. But what they do definitely know is what we are speaking about. When you remain empty, there's a possibility that you can become filled with something much greater. When you seek the lowest places, there's a paradoxical, powerful force in it. You don't naturally go and seek that. It's just because there's, it, there is such a peace and harmony in b- having humility. Mm-hmm. And as you said with humiliation, we did a podcast a couple of years ago on the power of humility. And someone did comment and they said, you are both wrong. Humility is humiliation. And I don't know if that was just a troll or a paid troll or they, they want to really believe that hu- there is nothing in humility or it makes them feel uncomfortable to choose not to fight, to choose low places, to choose not to contend with others. But unfortunately, in the modern day, especially sadly with the youth, because of social media, they think humility is weakness. 
And that's an unfortunate thing. That's a byproduct of social media. It's not a byproduct of actually the young minds. The young minds are actually being warped due to the, the social media companies because they don't want... for The bottom line for the social media companies, if everyone was humble, there'd be no drama on social media. Oh, that's right. There'd be no advertising dollar getting spent. Or there wouldn't be such a thing as of social media, <laughs> right? Oh, thank God. Thank <laughs> God. Oh. <laughs> anyway, but that's the point. Being empty and you can become fill, filled. Choosing low places gives you power. And that's why space and emptiness and choosing the low place are often common metaphors in Taoism because that encapsulates the spiritual essence of humility, the, the, the fundamental attitude we all have to have to go deeper on the spiritual path. And I, I feel as though a lot of people don't have that. I mean, I read all of the comments on our social media platforms and I see some people who struggle to have humility because they'll be very aggressive in their way that they comment or they have a know-it-all perspective, yes. so to speak. And all we are doing here is we're just we're teaching the great traditions. We're not trying to say that you are right and we are, you are wrong and we are right, but can you listen, as Lao Tzu says, with open ears, without having preconceived notions or opinions. Because only then can we have peace and harmony. You know, like there's a big problem with freedom of speech at the moment, right? Where for whatever reason, people don't want freedom of speech. They want full-blown communism. But Taoism is, in some sense, uh, it really leans towards democracy because it's open to different opinions and always says you should not have preconceived notions and, and, and allow others to express themselves in their own way. If that conflicts with your own way of thinking, you're an adult. You can just move and walk away. Taoism also is an art of minding your own business and allowing the world to run its own course as well. So, And that's a big thing with humility. It's about if you hear information in the world, how does it affect your ears? Or if you see in things in the world, how does it affect your eyes? Mm. Because that might mean that you've got too much condition and you, you haven't worn away that rock within your mind. Mm. And that's what water does, right? Slowly over time, it wears away that rock. Yeah, I think, um, again, to be able to recognize the quality of humility, how, how valuable it is, mm. is uh, actually takes a little bit of time for a lot of people. Mm. Because first of all, to be able to recognize the power of humility, and you need to gain a little bit of humility. Yep. You yourself have to be a little bit more humble mm. to stay open-minded, right? The reason why people are very reactive and compulsive is because they don't have such quality within themselves, right? They can't just sit and op have an open mind and sit and listen, right? Mm -hmm. So that's the obvious, uh, obviously a big problem. Yep. So once you uh, attain some kind of humility within your own heart, then you'll be able to recognize the power of humility and you will naturally do get attracted to this kind of knowledge. Yep. And along your spiritual journey, you will find uh, such great sages like uh, Ramana Maharishi or such great uh, spiritual place like uh, Tiruvannamalai or any other places around the world. Mm -hmm. You will get to find these places when you are ready. Well, that's the part of the Eastern tradition that Westerners and people from outside of particularly Southeast Asia and South Asia don't understand is that to have humility, you also have to have respect and in some sense, deference to a teacher who, who you have respect towards. You don't need that. It's not, not, it's not a, a standard that, has to, that you have to have. But what it does is that that cultivates a, a true humility within yourself. So when you have respect for someone else and say if you have deference towards them, because you accept that they have more knowledge than you. 
that's a it's a big thing right like and that's a big part of the eastern spiritual traditions is to have a teacher that you can finally admit knows more than you you came to the game and you thought you knew everything about the world we all do right we we're idealistic in our late teens and then we get into our early 20s and we start to work out once we're thrown into the real world that wow i really don't know jack here i don't know anything and so then when you seek to understand more about life and more about yourself sometimes you, you're lucky enough to come across the eastern spiritual traditions and then you realize that there's a whole ethos where you defer to someone who has more knowledge than you and that is a teacher of a sort a guru or, or what have you and ultimately then you gain respect for that person and then you have humility so this is a big part of eastern culture as you know because you're from korea these are like virtues that the only problem have uh in the east particularly in the far east is they can be contrived virtues right so you need to try and have humility you need to try and have respect you need to try and have deference you need to try and be compassionate when it's contrived it doesn't really work but when you throw yourself into the lines then of the east and and you are absorbed in the knowledge and you you seek teachers out and you know you'll find one that maybe is more palatable to you then you then naturally have respect and then naturally defer to them and then naturally you start to cultivate humility or i shouldn't say cultivate humility you start to open up your true humble nature mm. it's the socialization process that mm. takes that humility out of us because it makes us become a go-getter you need to you need to contend with others you need to be part of the mad rush you need to try and get ahead of others whereas eastern spirituality is saying you pull the plug on that you reverse that way of thinking yes and you choose the low place yeah again the education we all go through only the te teaches us to be competitive and make sure you win in the competition and you make sure you survive and whatnot so it's a very unfortunate it became even very foreign concept even in Asia, some of the Asian countries. Mm. Again, but here, like some lines says, that they do not quarrel, so no one quarrels with them. That is the Taoist sage's um, attitude, isn't it? Like they don't compete, so no one competes with them. Yeah. <laughs> the sage may appear to be a weak person or a little somewhat like cowardice kind of way but that's not the way at all because not to be compete at all it takes a lot of courage and um, it takes a lot of uh, strength yeah if you don't pick a fight no one picks a fight with you <laughs> that's the sage's perspective right yes. the sage's perspective is if you're not quarreling with others then you you won't f find others to quarrel with it's yes. it's natural and this is not to say that that's a, a cowardly mentality. It just means you understand reality at a deeper level and that opinions and beliefs and preconceived notions are, are all always changing with people. They are always changing with people. And that's why I remember once Osho love him or, or hate him, he once said, a, a TV presenter said that you seem to contradict yourself a lot. <laughs> and, and Osho said, contradiction is actually a good thing because when you start to contradict yourself, it's a sign of growth. Mm. And so we have these black and white absolute mentalities, particularly within Western culture, of the, you know, you shouldn't contradict yourself and this and that. And it's like, well, why shouldn't you? Because mm. eventually, so as you get older, you're going to think, entirely differently than what you did with the 18 uh, and that's why in psychology they say that if you're when you get to 60 and you still think the same way as when you're 18 there's some sort of psychological damage there and unfortunately a lot of people do go through that because they haven't had an experience that's broke their comfort zones they haven't had an experience where they've had to defer to someone who is superior to them in knowledge and understanding they haven't had these experiences they haven't become humble and so they've been in the mad rush for 42, 45 years and they're the same. I mean, they, we, 
straightened up from our education mm. and stayed that way for decades. And just like um, straight trees and uh, useless tree analogy mm. of Zhuangzi's story, that if it's uh, if the tree is nice and straight and firm and high, mm. it, that's going to be the first tree to get cut, chopped down. And that's kind of what happened to a lot of people, isn't it? Mm -hmm. You stay too rigid, too stern, too straight, then end up becoming somewhat psychotic. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You have to learn how to bend. Yes. You have to learn how to bend. It, the, the flexible tree is the, the, the one that doesn't break, right? It's it it, it because it can bend, it can't yes. be broken. Mm. But like you said, the one that's stiff, it's the first one that's cut down, and it's the first one that's blown over mm. as well because it's not a pliant plant. It, it's not probably going to snap when wind probably going to snap. And that's as you said, what education and socialization actually does to us is it makes us straight and hard and rigid. And so when we go out into the world, particularly as a young adult. We, we encounter a lot of suffering and struggles because we think that life is just going to work out for us. And then you get into the lion's den of adulthood and you're like, wow, it's not actually like that. Mm -hmm. Even though we, in this day and age we see a lot of adults behaving like their five-year-old children who just can't accept certain things in life. And part of the problem with the younger generation these days is they, they're all entitled. They feel, they feel like they're owed something. Yeah. And that's very laughable from older generations because you're not owed anything. You've got to go out and earn it in this world. 100%. <laughs> and so it, part of that is learning how to be flexible, learning how to bend when the pressure is applied. And that's why uh, martial arts in some sense adopted Taoism. Or, or I should say martial arts was an outgrowth out of Taoism because... The whole perspective of martial arts is to l learning how to be flexible and to bend with the world. Like if we look at Aikido or Hapkido or these sorts of martial arts that are all about absorbing a blow, mm. deflecting a blow, moving with it as opposed to force versus force. Mm. And in this chapter, Lao Tzu is tr trying to emphasize that if we counter force with force, what do we have? If we counter violence with violence, what do we have? So the skillful person in the world, a sage, knows how to deflect force, knows how to mm. be nonviolent. And instead of opposing the opposition, it knows how to move with it in a, in a skillful way where they actually don't oppose whatever that op opposition perspective is. And you feel that ebbs and flows of the energy and you move with it instead of moving against it, right? Yes, mm. exactly. Again, the, I, would, I wanted to mention about that useless tree analogy with the Zhuangzi story. Um, we've mentioned this a number of times throughout our podcast, but again, here it fits a perfect this story. The, again, the useless tree being... Um, bend everywhere and here and there there is no such like a sh exact shape of a tree bend whichever way the curvy and goes all over the place but that is why it shines its uh, true nature it never going to be chopped down why because it's useless <laughs> <laughs> but because the tree stays there for however long and again in the storyline there's a village where this uh, useless tree stands for a long time and village people come under a tree and when it's raining it, it'll um, make a shelter for them and when it's a sunny day hot day it'll give them nice shade and a breeze so that how beautiful it is how it serves a great things for village people so that just like that they, we should apply that to all of us as well. That, yeah. um, like you mentioned with the, the martial art, martial arts analogy, that when we're not forcing towards something, when we don't fight against something, but we, when we are able to move with the force, move with the movement of the energy, then we can truly be ourselves. We can truly shine our own nature, true nature. Mm. 
Yeah, that's why in the useless tree story, because it is like that, it's it's kind of an analogy for a sage too, isn't it? Because it's left alone, it can grow old, and it gives shelter to other people, and, and it doesn't judge who it gives shelter to. It's just like a sage, right? A sage is, is just like that. The useless tree is, is kind of an analogy for that. And so that what that means to us is if you remain humble and you remain you stick to the low places and you don't quarrel with others there is a possibility to have longevity mm. but also to become very wise as you get older which actually is very beneficial to the world as as I mentioned in this chapter it's the sages are a great boon for the world mm. and unfortunately because of the way the world is going we are having less and less sages in the world, <clears throat> as opposed in ancient times where there was <clears throat> probably a lot more wise people, you know, because it was easier to be left alone. You didn't have invasive technology and, and people wanting to know everything about what you're doing all the time and so forth and so on. And so in, 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 in relation to that, as we were talking about martial arts, like if, even if you look at Tai Chi Chuan, you know, the ability to move effortlessly in Tai Chi Chuan is a little bit about a Chinese song. Song is like a body and mind that's completely released, mm. you know, so you can move efficaciously without any uh, impetus from the fight or flight system interfering with your practice. Mm. And that's one of the po points of Tai Chi is to work on that fight or flight system, which actually inculcates unfortunately a lot of deep-seated tension within our body that we accumulate actually from birth and a lot of us when we get to 30 40 50 60 70 and we go i don't know why i'm always so tense and it's like well you've got it you've got a lifetime of accumulation of the fight or flight system downloading information of experience that keeps you in a, in a contracted state and so tai chi chuan and 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 the and the ability of song is to release that tension so that you can move with life effortlessly and that's a that's a skill of the sage is to how to move through life and not be blown over by the wind because you're not a straight and narrow tree you're that useless tree that gives shelter to all you have no preconceived notions and so that doesn't wear your energy systems out yes beliefs wear your energy system out right when you believe I'm Australian, I'm Christian, I'm a Democrat, I'm Republican or you know whatever, all of these opposing systems, it wears you out psychologically yeah. and it wears your, your energy systems out if you understand the, the energy system of the psychosomatic organism. And so the sage has no preconceived notions. They are open to change. Maybe they were left but then they became right <laughs> who knows <laughs> yes but they are open to change that's the point i think the biggest problem with the socialization and education is the fact that it has been giving us the idea or image of what's being complete what's being accepted what's mm. being kind of perfect mm. right mm that being straight, right, and like wear a suit. And suit itself, it's such uncomfortable clothes. <laughs> like, and it's just straight and there is no room to move and things like that. And somewhat, yeah, <laughs> you make sure your tie is nice and tight. And, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. Like, so you don't want to breathe really, too. Yeah, you you don't can't wanna, even breathe. <laughs> you don't want to breathe too effortlessly. You need to have a little bit of, yeah. You know, so we were trained from the education and socialization to be a certain way to be complete being, right? Mm -hmm. Socially accepted and look presentable in the eyes of others. But again, we know that's not the way. And again, the useless tree gives a perfect example to be who you really are and how, how to embrace the way you are is actually is really complete, that is your complete nature. That is your perfection. Well, it's right? like what we were saying about the suits, right? And getting choked by the tie and being stiff and straight. That's the socialization yes. training you. And then we mistakenly believe that's who we are. 
we've craft we craft this image of ourselves and the useless tree analogy is to is to say you should never craft an image of yourself you should be perfectly fine with your contorted branches mm -hmm. with all of these quirky things about yourself mm -hmm. because you are an expression of the Tao, your expression of nature but socialization itself teaches you that you don't belong you're not good enough mm -hmm. and we talk about this on the podcast all the time and i try to emphasize that you are good enough you do belong mm -hmm. to the world you are you are essentially nature itself you are part of sentient life you're part of the planet you you come out of the universe yes. like anything else like an apple comes out of the universe and we mistakenly believe that we need to be straight we need to be uh, cultured a certain way to fit into certain perspectives that run counter to our nature essentially yes you know and that's why a lot of people fall out of accord with certain societies with certain religions because they don't feel right they don't feel natural in that in that environment and we've all had that experience right like where we don't feel as though we fit in somehow. Mm. Where we see all other people, they seem like they're perfectly fine, they fit in mm. to a certain society or a culture or, and this and that, but you, you feel like, I don't feel, I feel like there's something missing here yes. because I can't be myself. That chop and shape way of um, the world got us even just more anxious, yeah. right? Just more anxious and that got us be too serious as well. Yeah. But again, embracing this uh, useless tree analogy or the Lao Tzu's message in every chapter yeah. is to really follow nature and that is to give us actually such a relief, right? Yeah. Oh, what a relief. I can finally be myself, finally can breathe and just, uh, just the way I am. Embracing where we are is that itself is perfect. That's, that's just fine. Yeah. Well, a Taoist is not flashy. A Taoist is very simple. And a lot of people find this hard to accept because we live in a society, particularly today, where you ought to be flashy. You ought to upgrade yourself, have additions to yourself, no matter what, whatever that is. You don't accept yourself as you are mm. from birth. Yes. And I'm here to tell everyone that you are perfect from birth. We all may look a little differently. We may be a little quirky and funny. But that's, the, that's nature expressing itself. That's your lead. And the worst thing that we can do is to try and change that according to whatever the socialization process says is right. That's where we make the mistakes because we start to craft that image in our mind mm. and then we fall out of accord with the Tao. Mm. We're not following essentially the way then because we feel like we need to upgrade ourselves. Yeah. We'll do anything to ourselves, right? We'll change everything about ourselves mm. to appease others and to appease the culture that we've, we are from. We're not comfortable to stand on our own two feet. And that's what Taoism really is. It's a, it's, a, it's a technology of simplicity that allows you to stand comfortably on your own two feet. Mm. <clears throat> this is who I am. You can accept me or, or not. It, your opinion of me does not bear any weight. No. That says more about something about you. Because you have an opinion of other people and how they are. Yes, that's right. Whereas you need to empty your cup and allow life to be as it will. Mm. And emptying your cup here is emptying all of the socialization process that you've you've been trained with. Yes. And I wanted to mention about these um, accordance of the opposites yep. here. Again, opposites as in, yeah, long and short. And in this case, like abandoned, straight, empty and full, wear out and be new. This concept in in this material world and dualistic point of view, these things are completely two different things, yep. right? Bend and straight, like the what's socially accepted, what's not socially accepted. Exactly, hundred percent. Yeah. Talked about it, but again, here in in Tao Te Ching, Lao Tzu always talks about how the opposites are actually not the opposites. The opposites are actually the same thing, right? Yep. Again, they, they are all interdependent and they're mutually arising, right? Again, the shang sheng, yep. the word shang sheng in, uh, in Chinese. And ying. And ying. Yeah. In, inter, ying as well, interdepen ying. interdependence. Inter interdependence, yeah, yes. Yeah, both of those words, yeah. Exactly. Yeah, so just like, uh, like a worm, how it moves, right? Yeah. It's to be bent is to be straight, and to be straight is to be bent. 
Yeah. So if you want it, if it wanted to be bent and if it has to be straight. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah, and vice versa. Yeah. So bending is straightening, and straightening is bending in the end. Yeah. So again, there is a famous talk by Alan Watts once he gave, "Where is the beginning and where is the end?" Yeah. Like he was talking with the pencil. Like there is the beginning of the pencil and there is the end of the pencil, but where did it begin, and where did it end, yeah. <laughs> and where did it begin to end, <laughs> where yeah. did it end to begin? Like yeah. so, in the end, the beginning and ending is actually exactly the same thing. So these concepts are uh, interdependent and mutually arising, so that there is no such thing as opposite concepts. Yeah. They're the one thing. They're the same thing. So, yeah, therefore, the wise embrace the one, the one oneness of Tao, right? Yeah. So set an example to all. They come from the wholeness perspective. Well, at the core, too, it's that, that corresponds with yin-yang theory, right? So out of uchi, out of nothingness, we have tai chi, so Tao in motion, which produces yin and yang. So mutual opposites. You see, and so we have the mutuality all throughout our existence, like you said with the worm, right? What is bent is straight. What is straight is bent. And the problem in our world, particularly in the modern day, is we have such a black and white interpretation of mm -hmm. life, and we don't understand that life is really shades of grey. It's not either this or that. It's both this and that yes. mixed together yes. as one thing. Mm -hmm. And so that's why the sage they res they resolve the mutuality into one. They resolve yin and yang back into tai chi, back into uchi. And that's how they can hold to the Tao. They can remain fixed in the Tao. Whereas when we are either remain straight or we are just being bent, mm. then we are living in a world of opposites. Yes. Whereas the actuality of it is mutuality. Mm. And that's where people get it wrong right like even if we look at it from a very base understanding man and woman make harmony yes breed life yes it's natural and that's the that's the thing that's a fundamental thing of reality yin and yang facilitates life yin and yang aren't separate hence why when we look at the yin and yang symbol you find the yin and the yang and the yang and the yin. It's yes. it's intentionally designed like that. So you, you don't think as in an opposite. And, it, and it's encased in a circle mm. as well, encased in uchi, mm. encased in tai chi. And so you don't then think in opposites. And this is what Dao is trying to get you out of, the concept of thinking in opposites. You need to think holistically. You have to think about things in, in a more grander perspective. Yes. And see, linear thinking and logic not that there's anything wrong with them, but when we when we hold steadfast to intellectual thinking and so forth and so on, we often dissect the world up into this and that, and we lose sight of the actuality of reality. That's the problem. Yeah, in the yin and, yin and yang symbol, people say that real quality of yin is is that which is within yang. Yes, yes. And the real quality, the authentic quality of yang is the one which is in the yin. Yin, yep. Yeah, so He's, that is to be that complete holistic, holistic uh, way. Exactly, exactly. You know, people, they don't think about the world in a holistic way, right? They see one situation and they try to resolve that situation just by... Mm. But then you see that if you look at the panorama of that situation, there's a lot of moving parts mm. that have to be addressed. Mm. And this is why in Taoism, there's a big focus on nature and emphasis on the interrelationship of nature we have the five elements theory and Taoism, and you have to get your mind around that and that's what the sages are talking about here but it comes to you when you become humble when you lower yourself you start to understand this idea that there aren't opposites there's only mutual opposites mm. so to speak mutual opposites yeah mutual opposites mm. even saying opposites is is incorrect yes, right yes. like we would say it's it's an interdependent mutuality is probably a better word because as you mentioned, Shasheng is mutual arising and Ying, which is mutual resonance or interdependence. Mm. And so again, when you have mutual arising, you have interdependence actually. 
And why do, is the world in conflict? Because you believe in opposites. Hmm. You believe in this and that and don't understand how you depend on the on the opposition mm. so to speak how could we have a great sporting com- contest without an opposition mm. it'd look pretty funny if the other team was out there just playing themselves <laughs> scoring all the goals and just go and celebrating you'd be looking going there's something not right here that's <laughs> there's no goalie yes. <laughs> you know what i mean so and and but that's how people actually want to live their lives they want to live a life without a goalie mm. they don't want to have opposition they don't see that in having opposition we produce play. We produce the lila, the the enjoyment of life. Yes. And the existence of the opposites, mutual opposites, make us humble. Exactly. Isn't it? Yep. Like, again, a lot of uh, young people nowadays uh, having conclusion of black and white way it kind of stops them to be humble, right? Because yep. they just want to pursue their own thinking and they don't want to acknowledge or appreciate the other way, right? Yeah. That That is not going to give any lesson on humility. But if you're acknowledging the opposite and you realize that how grateful it is to have a mutual opposite to realize the other, and that way we can learn something. Yep. Again, that place is a humble place. Well, that's why we are isolating ourselves from everyone else. Like, our relationship, for example, or our relationship with the audience. It is a opposing realities, but there's a mutuality here which combines us with the knowledge and everything else. And us on a personal level, love combines us. It's a mutuality or you know, interdependent mutuality. Yeah. And unfortunately, in this day and age, the young people, because of the internet and social media and that, they want to just exclude the opposition. <laughs> and shout the opposition out of the room as if they don't matter, their voice doesn't matter. And that's not humble. It's not a deeper understanding of reality, that reality is holistic. Mm. You've, you're trying to create the world in your own image. Yeah. And that's the problem with socialization. You're always trying to create the world in your image because it makes you feel comfortable and secure. Mm. So your survival, your survival temperament is a psychological temperament now. We're not getting chased by the lions in the savanna. We are looking for groups and positive reinforcement from those groups to, to say, yeah, man, I belong now. And the Taoist is on the mountaintop going, look at all these children. <laughs> look at all these children, you know, because I, I can stand on my own t- two feet, understand the nature of the world, be in, and be comfortable on my own. And my mutuality now is just with nature itself, with the trees, the birds, and the beasts. And... Not that we've just created this opposition in the modern day. It's just intensified in the modern mm, day, that's mm. all, because of technology and everything else. And we're not seeing the actual benefits of having opposition. Yes. We, we think having opposition is a negative thing. It's mm. not. Yeah. yeah, again, the there's too many images and too much noise outside which got us even more insecure, isn't it? So that insecurity only brings... Mm more insecurity and and that displays on in such way that not not uh, being grateful of the mutual opposites yes. right and not being able to be even humble right yeah 100%. so again like there's a sage's quality here not putting on a display not justifying themselves not boasting not bragging not quarreling Right, all these qualities of a sage is something for all of us to really sit down and think about and try to embrace it, all these qualities. And so that, again, he says, therefore they shine forth, mm. they're not distinguished, mm. they never falter, right? They just, again, like they, they themselves somewhat excluding from the, such competition and quarreling itself make them perfect exactly and you just have to think in a, in a very basic level we all we've all known someone who has boasted about themselves say about how good they are and mm. this and that and it's very hard to be around those people yeah because they're constantly talking about themselves how great they are and this and that and intuitively we know Man, there's something not right about that guy who just speaks about himself in a glowing in glowing terms a lot and so this is, again, a lesson in humility about not bragging about yourself, 
not uh, flaunting your success, not bloating your ego and, you know, these sorts of things. It's about seeking the low place, no matter what your accomplishments are. Derek says in his uh, translation that in some sense, the more successful you become in life, the Mm -hmm. more humble you have to become. Because the ego is a tricky thing because it starts to attach to accomplishments and it starts to overblow those accomplishments as if they're much more than what they actually are. But they're not. And that's why you need more humility in that yes, process. Yes, exactly. I mean, success you achieved, the uh, more you make it real, then you become far away from humility, right? Yeah. And the well, more we get to achieve something, we need to have a kind of healthy distance. And... Again, like bragging yourself, boasting yourself is somewhat coming from a place where you take yourself a little bit too serious as well, right? Like you think uh, your existence means something to others and like making it too much of a special, more special than others. But we know we're not. We're not special than anyone. Like we are, let's say, as um, special or as ordinary as a tree, you know? There's nothing different, to be honest. So, again, more successful we become, more humble we should be. Yes, and uh, more you humble you become, or and also you more become successful as well. Actually, yeah, vice versa. Vice versa, mm-hmm. yeah. And I heard a Taoist teacher once say, because you know, topic of specialness often comes up, and he mm-hmm. said, even though we can do great things as human beings, and it and we are a beautiful creature and it's, this is not a negative slight on humans but we are no more special than an ant mm. when you understand the, the, the holistic pers- perspective of nature we play a role on the planet for sure we are that light of consciousness in the dark trying to hold on to its existence but like any other creature too at the same time right? Mm. except we have the intellectual capabilities to, to be more clever about that but as you mentioned with the trees and this and that, we are a part of the planet. Yes. And it's about understand. If you understand that more, I think a lot of, a lot of more sanity and a lot and a, and a healthier future would be there for humanity mm. if we understood that we aren't as special as what we think we are, mm. even though we can do all of these wonderful things. When we when we strip all that back. And we, we see that, if, well, if we take all the ants out of the world, what's going to happen? Well, the world's going to be in a lot of strife. Right. If you take all the birds out of the world, the world's going to be a lot of strife. Take the trees. We know the answer to that. And so we play a specific role and we should not get too far ahead of ourselves in that. And that's actually a lesson in humility, isn't it? That's an ultimate lesson in humility. Human beings get too far ahead of themselves so what should we do well we we got to bring ourselves back and understand Mm. that hey wait up a second we are just a part of nature as well as nature expressing itself yes and maybe it's better to harmonize with that as opposed to destroying it and 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 being in conflict with other people that is a true role of uh, having human consciousness yes not to show off how much better than any other species or whatnot just to show off put on a display it's all about to understand the nature of universe really yeah. that's the that's why i think this consciousness and this ability to think intellectually and whatnot is given to us more of stewards of the planet right as opposed to just using the planet for our own pleasure so again this whole chapter is about humility it's about seeking in the low place it's about choosing not to fight yes Choosing sanity over insanity, choosing health over unhealth. And that's, again, the ultimate message in some sense of the Tao Te Ching and and Lao Tzu. So we hope you guys all enjoyed and we'll see you guys next time.